I am not asking you to wake up at four, that's too much. You will get jet lagged. But few minutes before six o'clock, if you have to study for an exam, if you have an important meeting or important presentation to make, whatever it is, you wake up early, you find that the thinking is crystal clear, the thoughts just flow. The moment the sun rises, there's resistance, the rajas comes up, activity. There's an automatic tendency to start acting once the sun is up. And this continues until the sun sets. After, suns, after sunset, what happens? All indulgent negative activities come up. Okay? So if you are serious about self-development, you have to shift your waking hours as close to Brahma Murta as possible, keep rajas alive and squash the tamas. Meaning, there's a famous uh, saying even in English, early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. But we have our own philosophy. Our philosophy is wake up as late as possible. There are people who go, are going to work on a weekday, wake up at 9 and 9.30 in the morning. Extremely tamasic. And then late nights. Bombay comes alive after 10 p.m. So what you're doing without realizing it is you are encouraging the tamasic content in you. You're keeping rajas alive and completely stifling the best qualities in you, sattva. Okay? Then you need to fix a spiritual goal. Every one of us, when we are in sattva, your mind automatically goes beyond the world. So what you need to do is fix a spiritual goal. Okay, you may not be able to fix realization as a goal, as definitely as a realistic goal you may not be able to fix. But at least have some concept of, okay, I need to develop my personality. I need to overcome these weaknesses, these um, the, the bad qualities that I've picked up. I need to uh, uh, develop what is already good in me. Some kind of um, goal you must have. This is a spiritual goal. And the next is practice karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga. We have no time to get into this. But I, if you are serious about self-development, I would recommend that you pick up some CD, book or something, and all of which is available outside, and study it every single day, at least a little bit every single day, so that your mind is exposed to these ideas, and then you know what kar karma yoga simply means, acting in a spirit of service. Bhakti yoga means expanding the, your circle of uh, love, identification, oneness. Jnana Yoga is sharpening your intellect to discriminate between the permanent and the impermanent. When you do this, all three means you're firing on all fronts. Your body, mind, intellect, all three equipments are dedicated or in, invested in spiritual capital. And the last, very important, avoid dissipation. You know what we do? We take one step forward, three steps backward. Two steps forward, one step backward. This is, what do they call it? Yo-yo effect, right? It's up and down, up and down, up and down. No, avoid dissipation. Remember one thing, you put in so much effort to take a few steps forward, don't dissipate it, don't waste it. Conserve it. And then you'll find a meteoric rise in your personality. If you're sincere and you apply yourself every single day, within a year, by the time we have lectures here next time, next year, you'll come with a halo around your head. It's one year is all that you need to, uh, not to get to realization. One year is all that you need to make a dis distinct change in your personality. So now, Yesterday, we were discussing, um, sorry, when, you see, as human beings, the predominant guna is rajas. 
if your sattva develops to such an extent where it is way beyond the upper limit of uh, human life, then you get into a superhuman state called heaven in which the gods uh, reside. It doesn't mean that you'll get into a different plane. It, it only means that you will enjoy a superior quality of happiness even here in the world. By the same token, if your tamas builds up to such an extent that you go below the minimum level required for human life, then you get into demonic states. And he says this not only in the Gita, he says this in the Upanishads also. What it means is demonic state again is a mental state where you live a completely indolent, a life of sloth, where you, are, uh, you find enjoyment in ignorance, in laziness. Yesterday we saw that when sattva, rajas and tamas are in equilibrium, the entire universe folds back to the unmanifest form. When sattva predominates, there is creation, srishti. When the universe is to be maintained, Rajas is at play, sthiti. And when tamas comes up beyond the acceptable levels, there is destruction. The most important thought that the Gita puts before us is you as a human being are not meant to fool around with sattva, rajas, tamas. You are born in this world to get to the state of gunatita. Gunatita means beyond the three gunas transcend the gunas and in the second chapter verse 45 he puts it so beautifully Krishna tells Arjuna in the 45th verse of second chapter, says the Vedas, the theme of the Vedas is the three gunas. Vedas means Gita included. Nistray gunyo bhava Arjuna. O Arjuna, become free from the three gunas. Free yourself of the dvandvas, the pairs of opposites in the world that are today crushing you. Nirdvandva nitya sattvastha, establish yourself in sattva. That's all that you can do. Incidentally, as a human being, all that you can do is establish yourself in sattva, eradicate the tamas and rajas. Once you get to 100% sattva, you move over to the fourth plane of consciousness. You move beyond the three gunas. Because to remain a human being, you need all three. And then he says, niryoga kshema, be free from acquisitiveness and possessiveness, both of which are rajasic traits. And the last is a sixer. Just as yesterday's match, the last ball was a four, boundary. We have to be one better than them. The last ball here is a sixer. We become atmavan. Atmavan means remain in atman. Why does he say remain an Atman? Because all of us hit Atman every moment. But you're not able to capture it. Between two thoughts. You see, it's, there is an x-axis. That's why you need to know a little bit of maths. There's an x-axis and a y-axis. Okay? So when the thought comes up in your mind, the thought goes up, hits the x-axis, goes up, comes back, hits the x-axis, axis again and goes down. At the point that it meets the x-axis, you are in contact with Atman. Because at that point, there is no thought. But you are unable to capture it because by the time you hit the x-axis, it's gone again. The Upanishads say it is like in pitch darkness when there's a flash of lightning, what happens? There is light. But it is so momentary and it is so bright that it blinds you further. Whereas, when you are Atmavan, when you are able to capture it and you remain in that state of Atman, thoughtlessness, again the Upanishads say, it becomes like your blinking your um, eyes, eyelids shut and open every few seconds. Right? But your vision of the world 
is constant. It is never interrupted. Thank God for that. It would be terrible if every time you blinked, the world went um, blank. So, in spite of the eyelid shutting and opening, your vision of the world is constant. Similarly, in a man of realization, in a person who is Atmavan, he's transacting with the world through the body, mind and intellect. But even though the body, mind and intellect come in the way of his vision of reality of Atman, in essence, that vision is constant. Body, mind and intellect are as if transparent. They don't come in the way of his vision. So anyway, this is what he says, Gunatit. Now in the sixth verse which we did yesterday, he says, he describes Sattva and also he says how Sattva results in attachment. What kind of attachment is, uh, does Sattva result in? First of all, Sattva is Nirmala, pure, Prakashakam, illuminating, Anamayam, healthy, curative. One sattvic individual cures all the ills of society. So you need only a handful of sattvic individuals to keep society going. And then he says, but sattva is also born of prakriti. He said that it's also matter, it's not spirit. And therefore, it attaches. How does it attach? It attaches to happiness and it attaches to knowledge. See, what happens is, in our worldly life that we are living here, in rajas and tamas, we experience a little bit of happiness, but we also experience sorrow. And also, the quality of happiness that we are experiencing is very low. Sense contact, little flippant emotions, and little bit of ideas, and that's all we have. In sattva, when you pursue the spiritual path, you get to the state where you are experiencing a happiness of such superior quality that you mistake it for realization. You've never experienced it before. You don't know what realization is. So when you get to that state where you are relatively free from agitation and you're experiencing a very high, subtle level of happiness, you tend to get attached to that. And he constantly guards us, cautions us against getting attached to this because even in the Upanishads, in the Ishavasya Upanishad, he says, Andham tama pravishanti ye vidyam upasate. Those who upasate, those who worship avidya, ignorance, means all of us. They are in blinding darkness, andham tamaha. That is understandable, we all accept it. But the next statement is what baffles us. He says, those who revel in vidya, they are in greater blind darkness. So a person who's reached the sattvic state gets attached to happiness, gets attached to knowledge. Those of you who've come here yesterday and today, if you like what you're experiencing, you find it is of such a fine quality, uh, the Gita itself that um, tomorrow if somebody says, why don't you come to a uh, dinner, there's this new fine dining restaurant that's open and I'm inviting you to dinner, you'll say, no, I have to go to the Gita. I hope you say that. So what it means is your ex the joy that you get from transacting with this knowledge is so great that you are willing to give up other things which otherwise you would have grabbed. But the tendency is to get attached to this. There are people who go on, or, have you read this Upanishad? Oh, you must read Taittiriya Upanishad, it's fantastic. And every Upanishad is fantastic. Every chapter of the Gita is fantastic. But you must understand, this knowledge is still part of the world. And what is the goal? Goal is beyond it. So therefore, even sattva results in attachment to happiness, attachment to knowledge. Sukha sangena, jnana sangena. And now we move to verse 7. Rajo ragatmakam vidhi, trishna sanga samudbhavam, tanni badnati kaunteya, Karma sangena dehinam. Know that the nature of rajas is passion. 
breeding, thirst, and attachment. It binds the embodied firmly by attachment to action, O Kaunteya. So, rajas is characterized by three things, raga, passion, attachment, desire. And as a result of this raga, you're constantly experiencing trishna. Trishna means thirst, craving, thirsting, longing for what you don't have. Society itself has changed so much. You can distinctly see there is more rajas now than before. You know, uh, two generations back, our grandmother's time, found that they, whatever saris they got at, as part of the trousseau, same thing they kept wearing till the day they died. Yeah. And replacement only took place. Today, they buy a set of clothes, within three months, it's out of fashion. So the whole wardrobe is changed. Trishna, longing. Everything is new. Jewelry which a lady got at the time of her wedding remained till the end. Today, you, can, you know that people are buying jewelry, how? The number of jewelry shops that have come. Every second day, somebody is going and buying jewelry. It's got to the stage where uh, there's a couple, a lady walked out on her husband saying, I think you're boring. Yes, it's true. So all the men here better watch out. If your wife finds you boring, you're in trouble. So you get, you have this trishna, the craving, longing for what you don't have, and attachment, sangha to what you have. Both bind you. Both imprison you. As long as your attention is, and that's why we said in the beginning, as long as you are motivated by deficiency motivation, as long as your focus is on what you don't have, you will constantly be experiencing this trishna, thirst. To make up and anything in the world, you can gain the whole world, but you will not be happy. Because the problem is not that, you see, if you were really empty and you went out in search of things, then you should experience it, at least a relative filling up. But it doesn't happen. If your fuel tank is empty and you go and fill 10 liters, it may not be full, but at least it will show some increase. No? The, the meter will show some difference. But in our meter, it never, it's always empty. If it is empty all the time, in spite of gaining things from the world, the, you should ask yourself the question, what's wrong? If your stomach is empty and you eat food, it gets full. But when your mind is deficient, you get whatever you want from the world, that deficiency does not leave you. Then an intelligent person asks himself, then what's wrong? And the scriptures tell us what is wrong is not that you are empty. What is wrong is you are full, but you don't know that you're full. And therefore, whatever you get in the world, it is impossible that you will reach satiation. So you'll reach a stage where you find you're unhappy with Bombay, then you move to Delhi. You're happy for a while, then you'll say, oh, this thing is not there which was in Bombay. So you come back. Then you finish all the cities in, Bomb in India and say the whole country is useless. Let me move to America. You move to America. For a while you are uh, enamored with all that is there. After a while you say, at least in India I had a maid, I had a cook, I had a... <laughs> <laughs> now I am the cook and the maid and everything, driver. So let's go back to India. This trishna, this emptiness doesn't leave us. And when you get something, you get attached to it. Endless problems create endless agitations. So the result is you get completely bound. Now he moves on to describe tamas. Eight. 
तमस्वज्ञानज विधि मोहनम सर्वेना प्रमादाल निद्रा तीभारत नाउ ही स्पीक्स ऑफ तमस तमह अज्ञानज विधि नो दट तमस इज बॉर्न ऑफ इग्नरेंस deluding all beings it binds firmly o bharata by carelessness pramada alasya sloth and nidra sleep so this when you are in ignorance it causes delusion we've seen this yesterday when you don't recognize a rope for a rope the ignorance of the rope is the seed for all kinds of misapprehensions you mistake it for a snake you mistake it for a crack in the earth you mistake it for a live wire that's hanging around you you imagine all kinds of things and once you're in delusion it is impossible for you to believe that it is only a rope when your neighbor says what are you talking about there's no snake there it's just a rope you say impossible of course i saw the hood and i saw it moving a rope can't move and you give all kinds of reasons why you believe it's a snake so as long as you believe it is a snake and you have some contact with it and you believe that the snake has bitten you you it then leads to all kinds of things there are people who actually get fever who experience pain who get swelling all of which is imaginary because the truth is no rope can bite you and so is it with us ignorance of our real self ignorance of our fullness ignorance of our self sufficiency and power has resulted in are becoming such weak timid silly stupid unintelligent beings don't think i'm insulting you the, the, it's the truth tamaha adnyanajam vidhi mohanam sarvadehina it deludes all beings so nobody is exempt from it that infinite all powerful entity that you are how could you reduce it to the state that you are in where you're begging at the doors of the body mind and intellect for fulfillment through perceptions and actions emotions and thoughts what a terrible state we brought ourselves to if you see the contrast it's uh, fortunately we don't see it so we're all right but if you were to see the difference it's uh, it's a pitiable state that we've got into so therefore what is required is knowledge all beings are deluded all of us have tamas all of us are in delusion so that way there's no difference between us you can't feel competitive towards another deluded person so what must be and what happens is pramada heedlessness where you prefer a state of stupor further ignorance to alertness you know a when you are in the state of tamas you actually prefer to be in ignorance there are people who um experience symptoms of discomfort they have pain here and they have uh, digest digestion problems they have all kinds of things but they don't want to go and see a doctor you know why because they can't face up to the truth what if something comes up is the fear and that fear leads you to prefer ignorance over knowledge nobody ever says uh, you know if you are not in tamas then you are restless to find out let me see what is wrong with me doesn't matter what it is it could be the worst of things at least i'll know what has caused my problems but a tamasic person doesn't even want to know that's a, that is pramada alasya laziness where you experience fatigue all the time there's nothing wrong with you physically but there's no energy no energy because there's no vision there is no goal there is no activity how can a such a person live you can only feel sorry for the person and nidra sleep 
Sleep is actual sleep, but it's also a sleep to what is happening around. You know, there is no, uh, there's no restlessness to improve the conditions that we are in. There are people who right outside their home will find a gutter overflowing with, with uh, sewage water, but they won't pick up the phone and call anybody to attend to it. Occasionally, the electricity goes off in Bombay, right? We're lucky. But when it goes off, nobody will pick up the phone and ring up the electricity supplier. Everyone is waiting for somebody else to do it. This is tamas, nidra. You're uh, emotionally asleep. You don't want to take the effort to think about, oh, other people are also living in the world. So what do you do? You take the kachra from your home and throw it out of the window. Doesn't matter if it falls on someone's head. This can happen only in India. So, Nidra and such people, the Isha Vasya Upanishad says, Asurya namate loka andhena tamasavrutaha. Asurya, asurik worlds such people live in, who kill their own Atman. A tamasic person is one who is committing the suicide of the highest degree. You're killing your own Atman. Now, let's see what verse 9 has to say. Satvam sukhe sanjayati Raja karmani bharata Jnana mavrutya tutamaha Pramade sanjayatyuta now in this verse, what he's saying is, as long as you're operating within the realm of the three gunas, you will be bound to the world. Now you'll say, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with this is, the world is in a constant state of change. 